our next talk uh, will be Moshe Zaguri. Uh, we'll talk uh, about order of non predatory species uh, that can help pre moderate their risk assessments. Um, hi, Moshe. Hi. Uh, so, can you share your screen, please? Sure. Yeah, just a minute. Can you see it? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so you can start your presentation. Okay, thank you. So uh, as Alexis said, my name is Moshe Zaguri and I'm from the Risk Management Ecology Lab at the Hebrew University. Uh, and today I'm going to speak about how safety cues, uh, or specifically orders of non-predatory species, might help the prey to moderate uh, the risk assessment. So I want to first start with an example. So imagine now you're not sitting in front of a computer, but rather walking near a swamp at night, and then suddenly the croaking frogs go quiet. Why do we immediately become more alert? So of course we explain it by our use, just like prey animals in the cues of non-predatory species for our risk assessment. So let us first start with what is risk assessment. So this is a process that starts with the gathering of perceptual information, which is then followed by uh, internal cognitive process that we first, the prey first estimate the risk level and then resolve what action should be taken or what is the most adequate defensive response. And of course, sometimes the level of risk does not justify any response or the prey might decide to gather additional information and repeat the assessment process. <clears throat> now, the information theoretic approach suggests that, of course, prey will use uh, as many sensory modalities and perceptual information as available. However, we in the field of predator prey, and up until today, we were focusing on information that reflect danger, meaning risky cues or direct and indirect predator cues. And you can think about auditory, visual uh, uh, cues of the predator as the direct one, or alarm calls as the indirect predator cues. And in this study, we were thinking about, we were aiming on the question whether prey also use safety cues to mitigate, to lower the risk estimation. Uh, and when I talk about safety cues, I mean cues of non-predatory species. There might be others. We were focusing on uh, others of non-predatory heterospecific. So I want to first present our study system. So I'm working in the Negev Desert in Israel, and I'm studying this cool creature, which is the desert isopod. And they are very abundant. I know, I'm sure most of you don't know it, but they are very abundant in the Negev Desert up until 50 individual per square meter. And this creature live in a family structure, that's just like us, two parents, about 70 siblings, all living without, uh, within a permanent burrow, uh, as you can see here, surrounded by their feces that they clean out. And they forage for about two hours in the very early morning every day, and then stay within the burrow for the rest of the day. And for their perception, they use mostly their contact hemoreceptors, which are located here in the tip of their antenna, uh, and they have a very poor eyesight. And the major predator of this isopod is the golden Isgari scorpion, which also reside within a burrow. And this predator uses sit and wait predatory mode, meaning he's sitting here just in the entrance of the burrow, we cannot see it. And he's sensing the ground and whatever prey comes by, he jumps out, grabs him, uh, take him and grabs him back to the burrow. And this risky area, which is the ambush site, there is here this very typical soil mound, which is made of the excavated soil. And also maybe you can see here some isopod remains. So, oh, sorry. So I wanna first describe a result of previous experiment that will serve as a background for this experiment. But first I'll explain the methodology of uh, we use, which is relevant for both experiments. So we are going out to the field and we locate natural isopod burrows, and then we surround them by cues uh, and we film the isopod. And the cool thing is that we do it, you can see here the sunrise, we do it before the isopod leave the burrow. So what we film is the very initial response of the isopods to these cues or treatment without any learning involved. So I wanna show you an example because it's always the best with behavior, but I'll first explain the treatment we used. So we developed a method to settle a scorpion in a given place. So this is what you see here, the inhabited uh, scorpion burrow. We had a control of a burrow without a scorpion, the uninhabited one. And then there was a no burrow control, which there was actually nothing here. We only drew this line afterwards in the computer. I hope you can see here in the video. So let's focus here down. We can see an isopod that start uh, to approach uh, this risky zone, the, the, bor the, the scorpion burrow. And you can see that once he encounter it, he actually climbed on the soil mound, meaning he's entering the treatment. 
And I'll, let, I'll tell you that this is the uninhibited borrow in this uh, replicate. Uh, and this fellow is gonna cross uh, the mound and go down from the other side. Now let's see a different uh, example uh, here in the inhibited borrow. So you can see this isopod also approaching the solar mound. But unlike the previous one, uh, this guy is gonna stop. He's not entering and he's jumping backwards and flee. So the approach we took for quantifying uh, the behaviors was using this decision tree that we, uh, we created. We first asked whether the isopod was stopping or not, then whether he entered the treatment or climbed the mound, for example, or not. And then we defined what was the terminal behavior he used. So the two examples we saw, the first one did not stop, he entered and then he crossed. The second one was stopping, he did not enter and he used this reverse behavior of jumping backwards, uh, which is the most extreme one. And here you only see the, the this is the spatial projection of uh, this tree. So the result of this previous experiment, uh, this is the set of treatment we saw and we see here different behaviors and the percentage that were used. And here we see the no borrow, uh, uninhibited borrow and the inhibited one. And we definitely see that the isopods stop more when they encounter a scorpion borrow and they stop even more when it's inhibited. So they can uh, differentiate. We also see the opposite direction in entry, so they enter less to a borrow uh, and even lesser when it's inhibited. And here is the behaviors of those who stop and did not enter. And we can look on it as an example on the reversing one, we definitely see we, they use it mostly towards uh, inhibited borrows. So what we get from this is that the isopod can perceive the presence of the scorpion in the field, the ambush site, this risky place. They can also, also differentiate whether the scorpion is there. And this is probably because of the smell, because they cannot see it. So in the next uh, set of treatment, we actually uh, tested what cues they are using. And the two cues we, we tested were the smell or the odors of the scorpion and the mound, the soil mound outside. And definitely these two um, factors came out significant in affecting their behaviors. So we can see that they enter less uh, when there is the mound or the odor, and we see it's additive, and we see it also here in reversing or changing behavior. And the outcome of this set of experiment is first that they use a multimodal perception of both physical and chemical cues. Uh, just like we saw in Aditi's uh, presentation, uh, two presentations before, that they use a, a multimodal perception. The second outcome, which is uh, was pretty uh, surprising for us, because even though we tested the mound as a cue, uh, many other organisms in our field site in this desert habitat create very similar soil mounds while they are boring, just like the scorpion, or while they are digging the soil for uh, looking for food. And then comes the question, why to fear this physical uh, soil mound? And what we believe is that they fear the soil mound because this soil mound has the probability of being created by the scorpion. So the isopod actually take precaution, they overestimate the risk and react defensively. Now, when there was the smell of the scorpion, we see that the risk estimation got higher and then we saw a stronger defensive response. And in this experiment, we, we were asking, okay, what about safety cues? Is there something that can lower the risk estimation and the responses? And of course, what can lower it is the orders of other creatures that create such mounds. So we were choosing four uh, animals in our uh, study season that create those mounds. The first is the fat sand rat, the Indian crested porcupine, the lizard, this uh, French toad lizard, um, and the, this butweed scorpion. The first two are herbivores, but the second two uh, uh, are insectivores, but they do not prey on isopods. From, so from the isopod perspective, all of those are known predators. So what we did, just like I explained before, we surrounded isopod burrows by uh, this mound that had the smell, the odors of those uh, non-predatory species. We also had one mound that serves as a control with no odor. And we had one mound that uh, had, was a positive control with the orders of the predatory scorpion. We filmed them as I explained and uh, quantify by this decision tree. And then we were testing uh, using statistical tests and permutation tests, whether the treatment differ from one another. And then for post hoc, we compared each of those to the control mound. And what did we got? So if we look in on the stopping behavior, we see that about 50% of the isopod, when they encounter a soul mount, they stop. The four, no, uh, or the odors of the four non-predatory species did not affect this behavior, but the odors of the predatory scorpion actually increased the, their tendency to stop because it increased the probability it was created by a scorpion and therefore it is risky. 
If we look on entry, so we see that the orders of the predatory scorpion decrease, just like in stopping, they decrease because of increasing, decrease this behavior because increasing the probability it was created by the scorpion. These two insectivores had no effect. They were really similar to the control. And these two herbivores increased the tendency of the isopod to climb on the mound, to enter into the treatment. Now, this is actually the first evidence of the use of safety cues, because what we're seeing here is that they reduce their uh, defensive responses, when, which we believe it's because reducing the risk estimation. Now, let's look on two uh, terminal behavior. First, the most extreme one, the most antipredatory behavior they're reversing. So here again, the anti the uh, order of the predatory scorpion increased their tendency to use this behavior. The two insectivores were again just as the control, and the two uh, herbivores decreased this tendency. I forgot to say also here the the porcupine uh, was not significant; only the fat sand rat. We see a similar pattern. We look on the other uh, side of the um, of the decision tree. Those who climbed on the mound and stop on top of it, the most relaxed and predatory response. So here we don't have enough power for significance, but we, we definitely see that there is a tendency to increase the use of this behavior when uh, it's the, the, the mound has the orders of the, these two herbivores. So to sum up the result I, sh I showed you, so like in the previous experiment, mound provoke anti-predatory responses because they take precaution and overestimate, overestimate the risk because there is this probability. This probability is confirmed when the, the smell of the scorpion uh, is present and therefore it provoke increased uh, defensive responses. And our main question about safety cues, the orders of non-predatory species. So here we got mixed results, but definitely we saw that they can mitigate the risk estimation, right? Uh, so we saw it for the two herbivores, mainly for the fat sand rat. Uh, we also had few um, significant results for the porcupine that I didn't show you. Uh, but for the two insectivores, we didn't see any change. Now, that, there comes the question, why not to, to react? Because they don't prey on the isopod, and there is this the smell. Um, and what we think happened here is that because many predators have common chemical leitmotif, the smell of these two insectivores were not enough to confirm the threat, because it's not belong to the predatory scorpion, but not also not enough to refute the danger of the mound. Therefore, it was stayed just in the same level as the mound. So I want to conclude and say that uh, I think we, we complete the, up until today, a unilateral view of using only risky cues. And we show that animals indeed use safety cues in their risk assessment process. They use it to moderate the risk assessment. And specifically, we were focusing on others of non-predatory species. And what we show is how would they negate the possibility of danger but indicated by the mound, which is an ambiguous cue. But also cues of non-predators can attest to the absence of predators and also, uh, in this way, moderate the risk assessment. And the implication of this study is first methodol methodological, because many, many uh, experiments that test uh, perception of risky cue use uh, cues of non-predators as the control. And now we know this is cannot longer be done because th these cues themselves might affect the risk estimation Therefore, what we need to do, for example, if we talk about audit auditory, where, where it's very uh, common, we have to, to use kind of a silence or a white nose or whatever, something which is no cue. Also, we need to go farther and check what are the implication, in, implications on decision making, like, for example, foraging, how it affects the use of safety cues, how it affects how animals uh, make decisions. And if we go back to the example I started with, so for us, if the croaking frog go quiet, now, will we flee from there? We will just be more alert. How will how it will affect us? So I want to thank uh, Dro Avlena. He's my uh, PI for my PhD and masters. Uh, my lab mates, those who founded me and my PhD, and of course the three organizers of this uh, wonderful conference. And I want to thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot for your really nice talk. Um, so, like, while we are waiting to have some question inside uh, the chat, like, uh, I think I have one or two for you. Um, like, the first one is quite naive, but, and maybe I missed the information, but why, why the isopod is actually enter inside the hole? Like, what is, what is the, like, um, what is the advantage for the isopod to enter inside this hole? 
<laughs> That's a different story. Uh, I can direct you. We have a paper on this in Oikos uh, last year. Uh, what we believe is that they are inspecting the predator, predator presence uh, because our central, uh, central place foragers, if they have a risky site, it's prevent them from actually, it's also related to the way they navigate, which is path integration. So if they have a risky site, it's prevent them from um, foraging in, let's say, all this slice, right? So they have the, the, these scorpions can create new burrows just like we did in the experiment and they can leave it after a few days, up to a few months, but it can be, they, they need to confirm the danger. So by climbing on the mounds, we, we saw it in a different set of experiment, they're actually sensing whether the predator is there. Uh, okay. And also it's a, for, you know, for us, we know it's a small mound. So, okay, why not just to encircle it and go from the other side? But because they have a very poor eyesight, if they decided to go to this direction, so maybe climbing on it, it's a less of a uh, of a cost for them just climbing, and then, you know, this is the way, this is the direction they want to hit. Okay. Um, like another question could be like, uh, do you think that there is a kind of uh, like coevolution between like your like like your like the, all these species, like basically like that, okay, your isotope is adapting his behavior, but maybe the predator are also adapting their behavior according to it. In which way, you mean? Uh, the fact that like, uh, may, maybe because like your, I mean, I don't know how to explain it actually. Um, no, like, I mean, I, maybe I will ask you this question later on the chat because like I, I, I will reformulate it. Sure. Um, so, so another really naive question is, uh, what was the method to spray the odor on the on the man? Actually, like, how what was the method? Sorry for to to spray the odor, like. Uh, uh, we we actually took a conservative way. We we took we 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 collected soil from the field site, and we just let the the, the animals, the different animals, to to stay on this soil. So, for example, the, the scorpions they were just on the soil. On top of the soil, all of them for exactly a week before the experiment, and we took it and put it on it. Uh, there are many experiments that they use kind of chloroform or other ways to, to take down the odors. We, we find it too aggressive. And this is another, uh, also might be an explanation why uh, the odor might be too small, and therefore it might be an explanation why they didn't react to the odors of the porcupine or the two insectivores. I see. Uh, Want to keep it conservative and not to put too much of an odor, um, and then no one knows if it's a reflect reality. I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I think we ran a little bit out of, of time uh, for more question, but uh, exactly like for all the other talk, like uh, people are really welcome to ask the question on your Discord channel. I'm pretty sure that you will take time to to reply. Uh, thank you again uh, for, for your presentation. That was really nice. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, we are ending the, the, the session for, I mean, the first session for today. Uh, thanks uh, all of you for your attention during all this nice presentation. Uh, we'll be back at 9 p.m. UTC plus zero. Um, and so like uh, we hope that all of you will be there to enjoy again. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thanks, everyone.